we were in a band at that time, it wasn't about making music, it was about making war against other bands. <laughs> this, this was a competition and we were going to win. That, that was our attitude, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. well, that, maybe that was my well, it, was more your, it was more your attitude than, than mine. Each other at college actually many eons ago and um, Eugene was um, a budding stained glass artist at that time and I was um, a first year art student and I was getting we, uh, myself and the rest of the group were getting shown around the, the stained glass studio and Eugene was like shown off like anything and he was taking great big pieces of glass and breaking them over his head I mean it was completely outrageous but I have to say that he did he did sort of mark it with these like um, glass cutters and then break over his head and I just was very impressed. So then we... Uh, <laughs> that was the idea. <laughs> yeah, that was the idea. So then we got to know each other and then um, my friend Gail and myself used to go around um, art college dressed in quite outrageous gear and Eugene was ta quite taken by that. So he asked us to... Um, well, you had you know, to be singers in yeah, the Yeah, they just wondered if we were singers because we looked good, you know. There is nothing for it, we just got to leave this orbit. about bands we liked and it was all about I, I was mad on Roxy music and David Bowie and we're talking about that. I was saying they're, they're really brilliant and um, Eugene was saying oh well yeah yeah they're not nearly so brilliant as the Rosillos and um, do you remember this yeah, yeah vaguely yeah and um, I said well I have to I have to say you know the Rosillos did not exist they were only like um, you know the smidgenest of the tiniest wee idea at the moment, they were not a band at all, you know. And um, so Eugene was saying, oh yeah, the Rosillos, yeah, they're a really great group. And I said, ah, them, I mean, they're just really, you know, yesterday I and mean, they've had it. You know, I just, I'm not, like, oh. I mean, you like them. I mean, how uncool. She was pretty uncool. <laughs> so I was like, really, um, Dropped yourself in it. I dropped myself in it, yes. Yeah. Hold tight, now we're on our own. Too late, now we're ready to roll. Too late, how I waited for. The first time we appeared on Top of the Pops was, was when we were on Top of yeah. the Pops mm -hmm. singing about Top of the Pops. Mm -hmm. but the people at Top of the Pops thought we were singing something nice about them. <laughs>
just as long as everyone knows what's in fashion, what is seen mm -hmm. on the front of a television screen. On the front of a television screen. It was just, the song was about putting down Top of the Pops. We never really once for a second thought it was going to end up being on Top of the Pops. But I have to say, I did enjoy, you know, Top of the Pops, very much so. It was a sort of culmination of, you know, singing in front of the mirror uh, fantasy that you'd end up being on Top of the Pops. So yes, I, I did. And I actually enjoyed the fact that the song was about it and it was all a bit peculiar. Yeah, no, that was fun. I Your friends, and by the time the band breaks up, you're enemies. Yeah. And it took a long time to remake our friends who mm. became our enemies. Mm. You know, we, 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 we ended up being set against one another, which was the last thing we really wanted, and that was the, the, probably the worst thing about life then, mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And for special treat, Simon, you can play it after all. <laughs> During this performance, we were on stage, live at the Lyceum, in our farewell tour. And what you don't see is, or maybe you can pick it up, is that everybody hates each other on that. So, there is no interaction with the band there. Everybody just wants to get it over and done with. They want to get that contract finished, and they want to walk off stage. Maybe it comes across, maybe it doesn't, but I'm looking at that film, I know exactly how I felt at the time. It was, it was the end, as we knew it. A shape and a breakup From the moment Don't let the baby for a party flicks Don't let the baby for a party flicks I have my baby cause she feels good So to share The baby and nails Bruce Thomas Black and touch my skin More than it works She is a thing I'm a bad boy, 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 I
The change from the Rosillos to the Revillos was partly due to contract and also partly due to the fact that we wanted to continue our, uh, our vision, Faye and I, when, when the band went two separate ways, but we wanted to delineate that. So I guess I, I harked back to the very first idea of where I got the Rosillos from, and that was looking at a Marvel comic that said Revillos Cafe. Funnily enough, Later on in concerts, like even back in the mid-90s when we were playing, we started to incorporate Rosillo's numbers because we felt we'd proven ourselves as songwriters because Joe was the, the songwriter in the band and everybody, you know, people threw in their ideas, but Joe, every now and then, but Joe was the songwriter. And Faye and I had to establish ourselves in the Rosillo's as credible songwriters in our own right. One of my favourite songs that we ever did was Where's the Boy For Me. Um, I like it because I'm just absolutely crazy about girl group music and um, harmonies and girl group lyrics and that style of singing and everything. Um, also it was, um, I think it was one of the first songs that Avillos did and it was the first song I really felt confident about writing. Um, so it was a sort of songwriting kind of jump ahead. The lyrics was kind of schizophrenic and also um, the way the music was. You'd have this female singing, One boy was really handsome, so it'd be all sort of floaty and girly, and then you'd have this bit, One boy right now, nah, well gimme, gimme. Like, Banging on the kitchen table. Yeah, there was a total contrast. It was almost like girly bit, mm, girly bit bass girl. were very new at that time. You didn't really know that you had to turn up at like nine o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the morning to get your makeup on and stuff like that. So we sort of wandered up at, in it about one o'clock and it was nearly finished and we just turned up. So we, yeah. shot, we, shot, the, we shot the whole, we shot the whole thing, thing in 40 minutes. Yeah, in 40 minutes we shot the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. I just thought it would be a cool idea to have a motorcycle hanging over our heads when we were singing rather than sitting on it, which would be the normal thing you'd do. I remember seeing lots of motorcyclists and rockers hanging around a chip shop in the, in, the, in the early 60s and that kind of mixture of teddy boys and rockers and greasy hair and you know that Kirsty McColl song that says there's a guy who works down the chip shops, chip shop, thinks he's Elvis. Well, at this time there were like 50 people hanging around the chip shop and they all thought they were Elvis. You're paying to see people, and you're paying to see something. And, and um, when it's mentioned that the, the, the Rosillos or the Revillos use props, I don't really see it that way. Today I see a pop video as much more of a prop to an act 
than what we did then. It's just that we wanted just a couple of our concepts in. So, you know, if I rode on stage on a motorcycle and Faye was singing about leader of the pack or motorbike beat, that was great. And those were in the days you could get on a motorcycle and start it up and there would be, a, you know, three gallons of gasoline in the, in the petrol tank and people would be jumping and gyrating around smoking cigarettes and no one thought a damn thing about it. Nobody got blown up. Nobody got immolated. I think people should be allowed to ride motorcycles on stage all the time. It just, what the hell? It's just everything's too safe now. Um, so, and as far as a Dalek being concerned, well, you know, we like Doctor Who. I'm, I guess most of our audience did. And just seemed nice every now and then, maybe if a Dalek came on stage and blew CO2 gas out of everybody. It's just, it's just the way it should be. It, I didn't see it as a prop, it was just part of what we wanted to do. I think lots of acts need props that don't have it. I don't think we actually need it any. Very much. I well, that, 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 it's, they're fairly arbitrary the way they go on. I mean, I never have any that match. I mean, it's just whatever comes to hand. But I do like dangly things. I like sparkly things. But in the old days, I used to make my own. You know, in fact, it was quite peculiar. It was quite ritualistic. I used to. Sometimes I used to make them out of cardboard, although it would never look like cardboard. And I used to sort of go through all this rigmarole of making them before I went on stage. It's quite peculiar. Sort of used, took took quite a long time to do, but always sort all sort of built up to the performance sort of thing. Because you couldn't buy what you wanted to get. No, I couldn't buy what I wanted. We found some old spectacles uh, that were like, that had dangly earrings um, incorporated into their design. Do you remember those? That's right. I didn't wear those particularly. No, they were, the, yeah, I wore them. But when you put them on, it's funny, when I saw the mask, that film The Mask with Jim Carrey, I knew exactly how he felt. As soon as I put those sunglasses on, I clicked in to what I had to do on stage. And we were already adopting a certain style by the time, by the time the Rosillos started up. We thought plastic and leather, yeah. We thought plastic and leather. It became self-generating after did. that. I didn't feel comfortable in anything else except leather then. But I mean, it's amazing once you got into that, that gear and um, once you got on stage, you did uh, definitely took on a different persona. In mm. fact, uh, yeah, I can remember that sort of feeling of metamorphosis from the first, the first gig. Once we made the dresses, we weren't really um, that into washing them. Sort of like we made them and then we just kept on wearing kept them. Kept on using them. <laughs> I mean, and, and <laughs> no. they were, you know, they were pretty pungent, I have to say. Yeah. But, you know, we used to, sometimes we spray, um, spray them with a uh, pledge, you know, or, or sponge them down. But um, there was something about the whole thing. I mean, you just wouldn't have done that because that would have destroyed the whole... They were, they were picking up essence as they went on, <laughs> you know. 
I had a plastic, uh, black plastic jumpsuit that was completely, it didn't breathe. Yeah, I know, yeah. And I had yeah. on these little kind of space boots and we'd be yeah. jumping around at a really hot gig. And then after the gig, you'd come off stage and you'd take your space boots off and tip them out. Yeah, the that's right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't mind singing about love as long as the girl falls in love with the monster, that's okay. It was one of those early kind of videos that were made out of plasticine, a bit like those guys that are made out of butter and stuff. And it's a it's an incarnation of the band made from plasticine. And the song was called She's Fallen in Love with a Monster Man, which was kind of funny that we were made out of plasticine. Probably looked more delectable in plasticine than in real life. sound. creatively inspired by each other there's no there's no doubt about it we still spark each other off don't mm, we mm. and we are we are really good friends mm. you know really are. I mean yeah. I, I, th I think um, that Eugene is some strange soulmate of mine that's what I thought when um, when I first met him and there's very few people that you meet that you have that that empathy with of course he drives me crazy as well but that's the way it goes yeah. but yeah <laughs> 
driving you crazy. <laughs> The thing about the whistle test is there you are playing live and you're playing to a virtually a brick wall, there's nobody there. It's just like a flat wall and, and you have to perform. But once you get into performing, it's kind of like being on stage with a load of bright lights shining in your face. You can't see the audience anyway, so we just imagined there was an audience there. And we really, really enjoyed doing that performance. The thing that really gets you is, halfway through it, you suddenly think, how many million people are watching this? And it's live. And at that time, that was the programme to be on. I, I think that was our classic performance. Hello, countless millions. This one's called Get Me Down. The thing about music is, it's the drug, the performance and the music, it's the drug and you never really can shake that off. I think it's, it's, it's in you and you can't get rid of it, you know, even when you're not doing it, you think about it. Well, I do anyway. But whether I do it or not again, that's still, I like it, it tantalises me. Will I do it? Won't I do it? I don't know. <laughs>